the U.S. goal is to limit China's ability both to access advanced AI chips uh, and to impact China's ability to domestically manufacture any advanced chips um, to retain the uh, U.S. ability to restrict which types of advanced chips China can access. And I think these controls, uh, alongside similar controls in Japan and Netherlands, uh, will present some serious challenges that will be hard for China to overcome. Well, today, for most types of advanced semiconductors, China's fairly far behind the cutting edge. There are certain types of chips that China does have advanced capabilities in, but especially when it comes to manufacturing advanced processor chips, the types of chips inside of uh, phones or computers, uh, China is at least several generations behind, which means that uh, they're capable of producing chips with far less computing power. First off, the sense that China has made a lot of progress in many key technology spheres. Uh, and second, that China's uh, military capabilities, especially in and around the Taiwan Strait, have uh, expanded dramatically. Ten years ago, if there were a war in the Taiwan Straits, everyone knows who would have won. Whereas today, if there were a war, nobody knows who would have won. And that uncertainty has increased the sense of risk among U.S. policymakers that China might decide to attack the blockade. A Taiwan and it's led the U.S. to think a lot more carefully, I think, about uh, the types of technologies that we to share with China that might have military ramifications. Well, today, every military system relies on access to advanced semiconductors, and especially as militaries around the world try to deploy more semi-autonomous capabilities, apply artificial intelligence to defense systems, access to advanced ships would be increasingly crucial. And that's true for China, it's true for every country. But the challenge that China faces is that the most advanced ships for AI are currently uh, designed in the United States and, and produced in uh, Taiwan. And so if the U.S. wants to limit China's access from these ships, it'll be hard for China uh, to produce the capabilities that China's military is betting on. I think it's a view that doesn't have any good evidence behind it. Um, it's hard to understand uh, why it would help speed up a country if it lost access to the most advanced chip making tools, for example. Uh, if it was cut off from research partnerships, uh, if it was forced to try to build a self sufficient industry in a way that no country's ever done before, um, it just doesn't really actually make logical sense that this would help China speed up its development. Well, I think the exemptions were designed so that the controls would impact Chinese firms, but it would not impact uh, non-Chinese firm facilities in China. Um, you know, we, we know what types of chips, for example, are produced by non-Chinese firms in China. Uh, those firms have a strong incentive not to share their technology uh, because their own competitive advantages depend on uh, them keeping control of technology. And so... Well, I, I think the Korean media has really overestimated the impact of the guardrails. Um, I think it was always clear that the guardrails would be uh, implemented in a way that was designed to limit major new investments in China, but not to cause business problems for uh, firms from Taiwan, Korea, or from the U.S. Um, and I think all the evidence we've seen uh, in terms of information from the U.S. government is that the guardrails will be implemented uh, in a sort of balanced way like that. One of the best of these studies done in 2019 by the OECD found that there were U.S. firms that received more money and subsidies from other governments than from the U.S. government. And so in, in that context, it's, uh, it's particularly easy to see why uh, the share of chips made in the U.S. decline uh, so dramatically. And so I actually think what we're, what we're actually seeing is a, is a leveling of the playing field. Um, now everyone's getting subsidies. In the past, it was uh, it was just certain governments, not others. And now every government is is, is providing new subsidies, new tax credit. Um, and so that, that is producing a, a slightly more level playing field. Um, it's not an optimal situation. It'd be better if no governments gave subsidies. But in a world in which uh, some are subsidizing and some are not, um, that will have major implications on firms' decisions. And that's been a key driver of why uh, now we've seen other governments enter the subsidy game in a big way.
I think most companies that have factories in China wish that they hadn't invested in China um, because now they faced a very difficult situation of uh, having to manage the political risk from the U.S. side, but actually more importantly, I think from the Chinese side, uh, a huge regulatory uncertainty, uh, for example, on, on the Chinese side. And, and so the challenge is going to be, I think, to uh, begin to wind down those investments over a long time horizon, so do so in a way that's not costly or as, as low cost as possible, but uh, does repatriate a lot of that investment uh, to Korea, which I think is what's going to happen. Well, I think the companies that have succeeded are those that can sell to uh, global markets uh, and compete against very efficient um, and innovative other firms. And, and so that has been the key dynamic uh, that has determined uh, which firms succeed and which firms fail. I think the key dynamic is going to be um, uh, which companies innovate most rapidly. I think that government subsidies and regulations will certainly play a role, uh, but ultimately the rate of innovation is the key driver of success. And so uh, when we look at which companies, which countries uh, are uh, the most successful in rolling out advanced technologies, that will determine uh, their position in the future of the ship industry.